the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Come worshiping before the throne of God. For the Lord, He is good, and His love endures forever. Bringing our trespasses and sins, we come before the Lord, humbly seeking his forgiveness. Lord, 
We pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Psalm 25 To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth, and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth, and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord, and therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my sin, for it is great. Who are they who fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They shall dwell in prosperity, and their offspring shall inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him, and will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever looking to the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and have pity on me for I am left alone and in misery. The sorrows of my heart have increased. Bring me out of my troubles. Look upon my adversity and misery, and forgive me all my sin. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they bear violent hatred against me. Protect my life and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I have trusted in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for my hope has been in you. Deliver Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, beginning at verse 8 through verse 12. Then 
verse 18 through verse 23. Ah, you who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing. Surely many houses shall be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield a mere ephah. Ah, you who rise early in the morning in pursuit of strong drink, who linger in the evening to be inflamed by wine, whose feasts consist of lyre and harp, tambourine and flute and wine, but who do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. Ah, you who drag iniquity along with cords of falsehood, who drag sin along with carved ropes, who say, let him make haste, let him speed his work, that we may see it. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel hasten to fulfillment, that we may know it. Ah, you who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Ah, you who are wise in your own eyes and shrewd in your own sight. Ah, you who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant at mixing drink, who quit the guilty for a bribe, and deprive the innocent of their rights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of all that he would save us from our enemies. From the hands of all who hate us, he promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen. A reading from the book of Luke. 
chapter 21, beginning at verse 20 through verse 28. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those inside the city must leave it, and those out in the country must not enter it. For these are days of vengeance, as a fulfillment of all that is written. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress on the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken away as captives among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years of time have come and gone Since I first heard it told How Jesus would come again someday If back then it seemed so real Then I just can't Soon 
Redemption. The book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 28, reads, Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh, says the King James Version. Father, bless your word unto our hearts, and glorify your name in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. The word redemption is a popular word in Christian jargon, a word we toss about in church circles. The thing about jargons is that they become cliché, overused to the point where the impact of the word is lost. Another reason why jargon, particularly Christian jargon, may lose its potency is that we become far removed from the original intent and use of the word, and we begin to see it only in our modern contexts. Therefore, let's briefly revisit this word redemption. In this exercise, we hope to understand how this word is used in today's lesson with a view to its relevance to our everyday lives. The English noun redemption describes the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Usually, we redeem something that was previously our own or something we have the right to repossess. The redemption of the item is understood to come with a cost. For example, we may redeem a gold chain from the pawn shop after paying back the money owed to the pawnbroker. This modern understanding of redemption comes very close to the Hebrew and Greek words translated redemption in the Bible. What must be emphasized with this concept is four things. One, the idea of owning a most valuable, precious possession. Two, the abject loss of that possession. Three, the price of redemption. And four, the one who is worthy of redeeming the loss. In the context of Christian redemption, the one to be paid is unimportant to the imagery the analogy intends to evoke. In other words, who receives the ransom is immaterial. An Old Testament example of redemption, pre-Mosaic law, is found in Genesis chapter 39. The prevailing custom was that if one brother dies without bearing a son, the other brother is duty-bound to marry his widow. The first son produced from that marriage belongs to the dead brother. This son would inherit the dead brother's property. The living brother must also share his possessions with this new family. This preserves both his brother's lineage and property. This also guaranteed that the wife and her children did not starve. This the principle of redemption was later written into the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. This would seem a strange custom in modern context, but the lesson of redemption is clear. In the example, we have the four things that we need to look at. One, a valuable possession. The first brother's wife, the first brother's life, the first brother's possession, and the first brother's legacy. Two, the abject loss of that possession. The first brother lost his life and his ability to carry on his legacy. Three, the unattainable cost of redemption. The dead brother could not care for his wife or leave for himself a legacy, he being dead and all. Therefore, the younger brother 
must step in to preserve his dead brother's legacy. And four, we have the worthy redeemer. The worthy redeemer is the closest relative, and in this case, the younger brother, who was obliged to be the kinsman redeemer. A second Old Testament pre-law example is found in the book of Ruth. Here, a Hebrew family of surviving women returned home impoverished. Ruth's Hebrew husband had died in Moab, leaving her childless. Her mother-in-law, Naomi's husband, had also died in Moab, and she had no more sons. They returned home, and Ruth had returned to her late husband's abandoned property. But as a woman, she could not own it. She needed a kinsman redeemer, one of her late husband's relatives, who would marry her and take possession of the land. Meanwhile, they were without an income and without familial support. Boaz, a rich, distant relative of Ruth's husband, soon discovered his connection to Ruth and chose to redeem her. However, the first right to redemption was not his. It had belonged to another closer relative. That relative would have gladly taken the property, but realizing that Ruth came with the property, he declined. Therefore, Boaz agreed to take up the responsibility. Ruth, incidentally, is the foreparent of Jesus Christ. Here again we have a valuable possession as our first point. Ruth and her property. Two, the abject loss of that possession. Ruth had returned home in poverty and without her husband. She could not claim her dead husband's property being a woman. It was hers, but not hers, as it were. Three, the unattainable cost of redemption. She must find a kinsman redeemer willing to take care of her and to take possession of her dead husband's property. So she had approached Boaz. And four, the worthy redeemer. And here, kind-hearted Boaz, although not the first in line, was willing to be her kinsman redeemer. Now, let's apply this to the New Testament and to Jesus Christ and to the doctrine of redemption. First of all, we have one, a valuable possession. God our Father created us in his image and likeness. He gave us eternal life so that we were like him in nature and character. Like him, we were beings easily capable of love and community. He loved us and cared for us. He prepared a universe for us, for our benefit, and he shared his dominion, the dominion of his creation with us. We were his children and he was our father. Next we have two, the abject loss of that possession. God lost us and we lost everything of value God gave to us. In our self-will and rebellion, we chose not to trust or obey God. God could not force us to stay with him. We had broken his holy law. We in turn lost our inheritance our eternal life, our capacity for communion with God and with each other, our self-control and our dominion over creation. We lost it all. In fact, creation became damaged and continues to worsen. Separated from the life of God, we were consigned to eternal death. The devil and his demons took advantage of our weakness and took possession of us and of all that was ours. Then three, the unattainable cost of redemption. We could not pay off the debt. The cost of sin is death. 
We could not pay it off because of the finality of the cost. Death was final and we were already dead in trespasses and sins. And finally, we have four, the worthy redeemer, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a worthy redeemer because he's our kin. He's our brother. He is the son of man. He was as human as we are, born of a woman. He is our worthy kinsman redeemer because he was sinless and obedient to the father, unlike our forefather Adam. Thus, he was able to pay our debt by his death. But because he was sinless, it would have been unfair and unjust to keep him in the grave. So he was resurrected. God resurrected him, and by his resurrection, our debt had been cancelled. He's also our worthy kinsman redeemer because he is the son of God. He is the very divine being who created us. We were created in his image and his likeness. Our loss is really his loss. He lost us. But he found us again and he paid our ransom. The process of redemption has already begun. The debt has been paid. He has redeemed us from the penalty of sin. No more are we subject to spiritual and eternal death. Our relationship with God is restored. He has redeemed us also from the power of sin. We do not have to let sin reign over our mortal bodies. Through faith in him, we can be as holy as he is holy. Now the promise of today's passage is that he's coming again. He's coming soon to redeem us from the presence of sin. The sinful world we live in makes living holy a struggle. We get contaminated in this dark and dirty environment. But God is preserving us. We who love is appearing. And God is using this opportunity to help us to confirm to the image of his dear son. We are under severe pressure to remain pure. But God asks us to look up to look for the signs of his coming and to let them be for us a way of increasing our faith and strengthening our hope. Thank you, Father, for your word. May we live conscious of the hope of your coming because whoever has this hope purifies himself. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostles' Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Suffrages, Suffrage A. Lord, reveal your love among us, that we may know the joy of your salvation. Grant peace within and among all nations, and teach our leaders wisdom. Endow your church with faithfulness, and her servants with knowledge and true godliness. Defend, O Lord, the rights of the poor and the oppressed that your justice may be known among all people. Lord, renew your spirit within us, that in us and through us your will may be done. The Collect for the Second Sunday of Advent Merciful God, who sent your messengers the prophets to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our God and Heavenly Father, we pray for your church in the world. May we be in it, but not of it. We pray for our Archbishop, the Most Reverend Justin Welby, our Global Shepherd. We also pray for the Anglican Church in the province of the West Indies, for its ministry and its leadership, and particularly for the Archbishop of the West Indies, the Most Reverend Howard Gregory. In our diocese, the Anglican Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago, we pray for our Bishop, the Right Reverend Claude Berkeley. Meet his challenges, Lord deepen his faith, and enfold his loved ones. We also pray for retired bishops, Bishop Clive, Bishop Wall, and Bishop Calvin, and for their families. We bring before you the Archdeacon of the Northeast, the Venerable Kenley Baldio. In our parish, the parish of St. Mary Takariga, we remember before you our rector, the Reverend Father Dr. Anderson Maxwell. We also pray for our supporting clergy. Bless and guide us all and strengthen us in your name. We pray for your providence in this nation and especially in the lives of those who love and trust you. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in your safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. Birthday blessings goes out to Miss Nelsie Edwards and all others celebrating their birthdays. May they be granted health, strength, and every other good thing for the coming year. Prayer of Dedication Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.